Stephen, I thank you very much for joining me today. Um, your background is in TV, Netflix series, etc. Um, the transition over to film, was that something you always wanted to do? And how does that transition lead to doing the Pacific Rim Uprising? Strangely, when I first started out, uh, I was writing spec features that nobody wanted to buy. Uh, and I actually fell into television. My plan was always to be a feature writer and then eventually con somebody into giving me a chance to direct. Um, instead, I fell on the TV and, and ended up happily working for Joss Whedon on Buffy. And that's where I feel like my career really started. He was so supportive, and he wanted all of his writers to learn everything they could about how to make a TV show. And part of that was directing. Uh, I had mentioned that I, I was interested in, in directing. And uh, when I landed on his other show, Angel, he said, look, uh, I'll give you a chance to direct an episode. Uh, and he did, and it went pretty well. I ended up directing a few more episodes of Angel. Then I went to Smallville, directed a couple of episodes of that. Worked with Joss again on Dollhouse, and uh, I was directing an episode of that when uh, Spartacus happened. And uh, the next thing I directed was actually the finale of uh, season one of Daredevil. Yep. Uh, it was the first time my schedule really allowed me to get back in the director's chair, and, and I got the bug again. I, I enjoyed it so much. It was the biggest thing I had done at that point. So uh, I had written a small spec feature, a uh, psychological thriller, three people in a house, yep. basically a small $8, $10 million movie, six-week shoot maybe. And uh, Mary Parent read it, really liked it, and we set it up at Paramount. And we were in the process of trying to cast it when I got a call from Mary out of the blue one day. And she said, eh, maybe that's not going to be your directorial debut. What do you think about Pacific Rim 2? And I was like, <laughs> That's quite a bit bigger. Um, but ultimately, really, it was just like a supersized version of everything I've done in television. I, I've done action and visual effects and big stunts. And this was just on a much grander scale. Yeah. But along with that bigger scale comes an amazing support system with, with the crew, the DP, the production designers. So you're very well taken care of. Speaking of that bigger scale, sometimes when it comes to movies like these featuring these larger than life kind of characters, machines, sometimes the fight scenes can be these measures still, we can't really see what's going on. What I love about this film is that it's visible. The Jaegers have a fighting technique and you can see it. Mm -hmm. Speaking about the techniques themselves, do you look at real life combat techniques and transition that over to the big screen with these mechanical creatures? Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, we have a stunt team that helped us design the fights. So, uh, you know, there's motion capture and video reference that we take of, of actual humans fighting, of, of doing these moves and these different styles and techniques. And then that's translated into previs, which is a very rudimentary uh, uh, kind of, of CGI roadmap. And from there, eventually, it becomes the full-blown finished CGI. So that, that, especially in a movie like this, um, where it's the people inside, the humans inside, operating these Jaegers. Yep. We wanted that to translate on the outside and for them, for the Jaegers to move in a, a, a very human way. Yep. Um, so I am a big fan of giant monster movies. Just love them. I know you're still a big fan of these yes. kind of larger things as well. It seems over the last several years, the genre has really come back in a big way. What do you think are the conditions now where this genre of style of film has been able to flourish in a way that it has. I tell you, part of the reason that I think this style of genre has flourished again, the, the giant monster movie, is the technology. Yeah. Is, uh, it doesn't have to be man in suit or stop motion anymore, which I still adore. Uh, when I go back and I, I look at the, the, the classic Ray Harryhausen stop motion or, or the, the classic man in suit uh, monster movies out of Japan, mm. um, I, I, I love them as much today as I did when I was a kid. But now we have the technology to make them look real and make the, the destruction and the spectacle photorealistic. And I think that's a large reason of why these movies have come back into fashion. Um, big thing these days is the trend of a shared cinematic universe. Legendary on top of Pacific Rim, mm -hmm. King Kong. Godzilla, can you foresee in the future maybe all of these kind of properties coming together and clashing in some sort of way? I certainly can see a shared universe, and, and I've actually pitched Legendary uh, how those universes would cross over into one giant Godzilla, Kong, Jaeger movie. 
Uh, whether or not that happens, that's uh, totally up to the, the marketplace, and, and uh, that's way above my pay grade. But I, for one, would love to see that. Because I remember when I was a kid and I, I saw uh, Destroy All Monsters, and my head exploded of how much I loved all of them coming together. Yep. Last question, and I think you're in a unique position where I can ask you this. Coming from world TV, Netflix streaming, and also now venturing into the world of cinema, once upon a time, TV filmmaking was TV filmmaking, but now it's becoming much more cinematic. Things like stuff you were involved with, Daredevil. You look at feature films like Bright and all this kind of stuff. Um, where do you think in the future the convergence to come from what belongs in one medium compared to another? Do you think we're going to see more of a traction between the two where maybe films like Pacific Rim might go towards a TV market and maybe things like a Daredevil might go towards a film market? Is there that place for the sharing of it or do you think they're going to stay in their perspective law boxes? I think the lines between television and, and movies has completely blurred um, for the better. Uh, TV at one time had a bad rap. Basically, feature people didn't want to go into TV. Yeah. Um, I remember when I called up my agents and said, uh, when I had my small thriller, and I said, hey, I, I want to get into features. Uh, they said, are, are you crazy? Everybody from features is trying to get into TV. I go, well, that's a perfect time to get into features. Yeah. Um, I, I think, but they're both different animals. For me, I love doing long-form television. You can really get in there with the characters, and also nowadays the budgets are high enough that you can shoot them more like a feature. But on the flip side, for me, there's nothing like going into a movie theater and the lights go down and seeing it on the big screen. It's an experience that is, is indescribable, and you don't get when you're watching a movie at home. Um, so I think, yes, there's a lot of blending, but I don't think movies are going away. Uh, I, I, and I, I would love to see more things like bright yeah. and, and big swings taken on the television side. Um, you have to have deep pockets for that. So I think that's more along the lines of a, of a Netflix and Amazon, probably an Apple in the future. But I, I, I think for especially for a spectacle like this, you want to see it on the big screen. And, and a movie like this also lends itself to 3D. And just seeing it um, in that kind of scope uh, just makes the action and the size even more intense. Well, you've done a great job with it with your first uh, feature film debut. Thank Congratulations you. to you, and thanks again for your time. Thank you so much. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you.